We at IRI believe that democracy is more than elections. What happens between elections, governing, is equally important. Along with our continuing work to develop political parties and civil society and promote open elections, governance programming is a core component of IRI's efforts to advance and support democracy worldwide. Through our programs, we work to strengthen the capacity of government and promote greater accountability by elected officials. Equally important, we work alongside civil society to strengthen its ability to advocate for government and perform the essential task of oversight. IRI has worked in Kenya since 1992, focusing on party agent training, polling, and strengthening the ability of political parties to advance and implement legislative agendas. Since 2010, however, IRI has been conducting governance programming in the city of Mombasa. This work is funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. These governance programs focus on improving the effectiveness of governing institutions and increasing the avenues of exchange between officials and citizens. Specifically, our programs are providing local government institutions with relevant and current quantitative and qualitative data, training municipal officials on the implementation of mechanisms for greater citizen participation, and improving the overall flow of communication between citizens and public officials. We are pleased today to host a discussion on governance in Africa with a particular focus on Kenya. We hope through this discussion you will gain a better understanding of the complexity of the governance challenges in that country, but we also seek to put attention on strategies that promote and enhance democratic governance and thereby contribute to a stronger foundation to address the challenges of poverty reduction and greater respect for human rights and the rule of law. It is my pleasure to turn to the Honorable Connie Newman to introduce the other presenters and lead today's discussion. Ms. Newman has had a distinguished career in government with extensive experience related to Africa. She has served both as Assistant Administrator for Africa at the U.S. Agency for International Development and as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. From her State Department position, she also served within the G8 as the personal representative of President George W. Bush on Africa. Her experience in the region also includes efforts to build partnerships between African governments, non-governmental organizations, and multinational corporations with the goal of supporting greater African ownership and participation in development issues. And we are pleased that she brings this experience and expertise to IRI as a member of our board of directors. So Connie, I turn it to you. And again, welcome to everyone. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> I, I first of all want to thank uh, thank all of you for for coming, and I'd like to thank the uh, panelists uh, for agreeing to participate and to lead the discussion that we're going to have. We're not the only people who are going to speak this morning. I just thought I'd warn you of that. And if no one volunteers, people who've been with me before, you know I just call on you. <laughs> Get ready for it. Uh, but before turning, um, turning the, to the panelists, I'd like um, to have you think about four uh, true-false questions. And I'll uh, share my brief uh, thinking about those questions, but I'm hoping that during the morning we'll touch on the questions both through our discussion with the panelists and just amongst ourselves. First, true or false, there can be absolutely no development and reduction of poverty when democratic governance is minimal. First question, true or false. Second, the most difficult task of development partners in promoting democracy in Africa is getting people who are poor 
to understand the relationship of their participation in government and their economic well-being. Third, democratic governance in Africa is decreasing, except at the local level. True or false, and the final question, there is great progress in democratic governance in Africa and hence great progress in development. The problem is media coverage. Now on this first one, and, and I'm only, don't worry, Monica, I'm only going to take like five minutes because I know we mainly want to hear from the others. But this, this first one, there can be absolutely no development and reduction of poverty when democratic governance is minimal. My answer to that is false. Reduction of poverty in recent and contemporary history uh, can be attributable to two processes, economic growth, which creates opportunities and jobs, and political processes, which develop and sustain institutions that provide protection against unfairness. The, the institutional problems that characterize so many countries with high poverty levels are weak and arbitrary governance, weak protection of civil liberties, inadequate regulatory and legal framework to guarantee property rights and enforce contracts that deprive the countries of investment and economic growth. It's well accepted then by most in the field of development. The notion of participation is at the center of poverty reduction. The people being served must be considered as principal actors of development. They can no longer be seen as passive recipients. They are strategic partners rather than target groups. We even have to change our language in the development business. And the, they must play a major part in designing their future. I say all of that, but I also want us to be honest that there are countries where democratic governance is limited, and yet there's minimal poverty. Just take Singapore, for example. The uh, Economist Intelligence Unit classifies Singapore as a hybrid country, hybrid authoritarian and, and some democratic. Freedom House does not consider Singapore as an electoral democracy, ranks the country partly free, has one party, uh, extremely poor in uh, political participation, and that's agreed upon. But if you look at the statistics about Singapore, you find that Singapore has less than 3% of the population below the poverty level. Now, it is true there's some caveats to that. The first caveat being that Singapore does not, is not transparent in its reporting of its poverty level. But people can look at what is going on there and know that it is fairly low. And the second thing is that uh, the poverty in Singapore is concentrated in certain groups, mainly the immigrants. So, and their uh, movement out of poverty is not um, taking place. So that's the caveat on the, on the conclusion here. On the second question, the most difficult task of development partners is getting people who are poor to understand the relationship between participation in government and their economic well-being. That's, that's false. People know that there's a relationship between their participation and their economic well-being. That's not, that's not the problem. And a former president in Becky, who's somebody I have disagreed with on both his position on HIV AIDS and how he's dealt with Zimbabwe, doesn't mean that he doesn't have good ideas on other, on other points. And he has, he has pinpointed 
the problem of uh, development, and it has to do, he says, with the lack of leadership. That um, what has happened is there is throughout Africa selfish uh, leadership that is not uh, creative, and the other examples of leadership there are uh, leaders who are not uh, risk takers, um, attempting to solve problems in ways that might jeopardize uh, their own positions. More on that later. But the third question, democratic governance is decreasing except at the local government level. This is false. In fact, the last Freedom House uh, report of the survey, their annual survey, showed that the only region with modest improvements was Sub-Saharan Africa, where at least three countries improved their scores over the course of the year. Senegal's score improved, as did Mauritania. Um, Madagascar uh, and, and uh, Eritrea, however, are still um, problematic. But the assumption that Africa as, is falling back uh, is not a correct assumption if you look at the numbers or if you even pay attention to what's actually going on. Which gets to my final Q&A, which is part of the problem <laughs> that is tied to all of these. And the question is, is, is the great progress in democratic governance in Africa, and there's great progress in development, the problem is the media. I say that that is partially true. The coverage of Africa and the lack of balance in the coverage and the lack of honesty about what is going on in Africa is contributes to the lack of investment in Africa, the lack of hope in Africa. And that's not to say that there are not problems in development, that there are not problems in uh, building uh, democratic governments in Africa, but Africa is suffering from particularly the Western media uh, failure some of it is a lack of knowledge, but some of it is uh, basic um, attitudes that um, I think all of us who care about Africa have to change because people respond to what it is that they get from, uh, the, from the media. I want to talk about a few of these later on, but I want us to hear from our wonderful panel. Now you have in your packets um, material on each of the speakers. And I'm not going to assume that you did not read it. So I'm just going to tell you a few things about each um, speaker um, that is not in the packet. And in fact, you might not find it too many places. So I'm going to start with the Ambassador Mark Green, who's going to be our next speaker. So if you Google Mark, Green, Ambassador, former Congressman Mark Green. Um, the first articles that come up are going to show that he's managing director of the Malaria Policy Center, uh, member of the board of directors of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, former ambassador to Tanzania, uh, four-term member of Congress from Wisconsin. But if you go, if you go past the first listing on the Google site, so you find out some other things about him. Now, he went to the University of Wisconsin, but there he was named National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics member of the All-American Swimming Team. Hey, clap. <laughs> <laughs> but. But, uh, but more relevant to this panel's discussion, um, Ambassador Congressman Green has said, and he said it in, in a number of venues, that foreign assistance is not simply do-gooderism. Is that actually a word? <laughs> uh, do-gooderism. 
although it certainly does considerable good. Foreign assistance projects open hearts and minds to America's message of liberty, fairness, and free markets. And he goes on to encourage. He says, now is the time for conservatives to raise their voices in support of pro-development, pro-reform, foreign assistance policy. With that, I would like to introduce uh, Ambassador Green. Well, thank you. First off, thanks to IRI for having me uh, in today. I'm a great admirer of IRI's work. Back in 2002, I was actually a one-person congressional delegation to Kenya for the elections <coughs> in December and worked closely with IRI and was terribly impressed with the quality of, of the folks that I met with, but the work that was being done. And I'm honored to join this panel. Uh, Connie Newman is a long-time distinguished friend of Africa who has been a great voice for development in Africa and lifting lives and building communities, and it's an honor to be with her. Belozi Odembo, Ms. Shamiwa Mcharo, we would say in East Africa, all protocols observed. I am honored to be with these great leaders, and uh, they are great perform, uh, uh, reform leaders that are important voices for all of us to hear from. The title of today's panel, Democratic Governance in Africa, does it exist and is it delivering? Uh, I think asks the right question. You know, we Americans celebrate democracy as one of our core values, and every American can tell you that we believe strongly in democracy. But we also recognize, and, uh, recognize that achieving democratic elections is not the end of the story. In so many ways, it's just the beginning of the story. History tells us that democracy is no guarantee of prosperity and a lack of prosperity or at least a lack of economic progress can be a threat to the survival of democracy. No matter how democratic a government is, a government that is unable to deliver and fulfill expectations is one that is in trouble. There's nothing more corrosive than the sense of frustration and despair that can easily arise from unfulfilled economic expectations, especially among our youth, especially in this age of instant communications and social media. Uh, what my biography doesn't say is that a little over 20 years ago, I taught school in a small Harambe school in uh, Kakamega, near Kakamega in western Kenya. Many of my students back in the late 80s had never seen a building more than two stories high or three stories high. We had but one telephone in that little village. It was a wind-up telephone on a wooden box. So for my students, so many of them, Nairobi, Mombasa was the other side of the world. But things have changed. With great radio penetration, satellite <laughs> TV, more and more available, mobile phones everywhere. Young people today are looking beyond their shamba, that small garden. They're looking beyond their village. They're even looking beyond their country and measuring their opportunities against their contemporaries from around the world. And where their opportunities are falling, they're demanding answers. Very briefly, I'd like to summarize why I think this topic is so very timely. While African democracy and African economic development will be decided by Africans and should be decided by Africans, as Connie said, all of us as friends of Africa, we need to be ready to help. We need to be ready to offer assistance when asked. And most importantly, we must stand ready to help reinforce and reinvest where positive change is underway. First, and I think this is really the most important news uh, of these last months and last years, and I think Connie alluded to it, more and more African leaders are looking at these issues of economic growth and the role of government <coughs> institutions in delivering results to their people. The best example of this might be the growing popularity and aware, awareness of Mo Ibrahim's work. 
Mo Ibrahim, the billionaire philanthropist, you know, he's best known, of course, for the Mo Ibrahim Award, which gives a rather large sum of money to departing African heads of state if they meet certain conditions. But Mo Ibrahim himself is far prouder of the Ibrahim African Government Index and that his foundation has designed and publishes each year. As he puts it, the Ibrahim Index aims to establish a framework for assessing governance in Africa that is focused on government delivery. Again, the index recognizes that the ability of institutions to meet the needs of their people and to create opportunities for their people is absolutely essential. And without that delivery, democracy is fragile and its promise may seem to too many people rather empty. Because this index is created by an African on behalf of Africans, it is well covered by the media all over the continent. African leadership measuring African leadership. But again, I think it's important for all of us when we look at that kind of leadership and the rising tide that's pushing for change, we have to think about the positive role that we can play as friends. And I think that we have some tools to do just that to help efforts like those of Mo Ibrahim. And one example I would point to is the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Like the Ibrahim Index, the MCC's work is index-based or indicator-based, as we call it at the MCC. In order for a nation to qualify and to partner with the Millennium Challenge Corporation, it must maintain certain scores on 17 objective indicators that in many ways measure the same kinds of governance principles and results that the Ibrahim Index attempts to do. It's important to remember that these indicators don't measure abstract principles. They measure outcomes from programs. They measure the strength of institutions that are supposed to be delivering for those people. And that's a very important distinction. The indicators of the MCC don't focus on health in the abstract. They measure the capacity of a Ministry of Health to immunize its people. It doesn't focus on abstract capitalism. It measures the quality of government regulatory process, and it measures a government's trade policies. But I think the best example of MCC's focus on the strength of democratic institutions, and not just democracy itself, is the one MCC indicator that is absolute. There's one indicator that is pass-fail, corruption control. If a government does not exceed the median of the countries in its income class, it cannot be a partner to the MCC through a compact. Now, as Americans, we recognize that one reason for us that that control of corruption indicator is so important is that we want to assure, assure that that money, which is not the government's money, but is the money loaned to the government by hardworking taxpayers all over this country, we want to make sure that that money does not go into the pockets of the wrong people. But there's another reason why it's the most important of the measurements of whether a democracy has strong institutions and whether it is delivering. In the long run, uncontrolled corruption lowers productivity, it discourages investment, it reduces public confidence in institutions, it limits the development of small and medium enterprise enterprises, and it undermines investments in health and in education. In fact, the World Bank refers to corruption as the single greatest obstacle to economic and social development anywhere in the world. There's another feature of the MCC that I think makes it a good model for our foreign policy and our assistance in places like Africa. The MCC does not provide grants. Instead, it enters into compacts. These are agreements between sovereign countries. These are bargains amongst friends. 
when I served as ambassador to Tanzania, that's when the MCC compact was signed. It was the largest compact in the world. And when the press used to ask me about it, I used to say, look, we're not giving anybody anything. Instead, we are entering into an agreement, and each side has obligations. On the Tanzanian side, the obligation is for reform and to strengthen institutions. Our side of the obligation is to help provide the resources to far-sighted leaders to do just that. And then they would ask me, well, is, what will happen? Will you, if there's a change in government in the U.S., will the grant not happen? Look, it's just not that. It's an agreement. Tanzanians will decide whether the money flows. As long as Tanzanian reformers rise and make change and live up to their obligations, the money will flow. And I used to find that Tanzanians looked more fondly on that kind of assistance than anything else. Because again, it wasn't a handout. Perhaps it was a hand up. It was an agreement among equal friends, both trying to promote prosperity, poverty relief, and the strength of democratic institutions. As to the specific question of whether democratic governance is delivering in Africa, certainly in many places and in many ways the answer is yes. For example, many analysts believe that in Africa economic growth next year will be over 6%. I would suggest that President Obama would be doing cartwheels if America would have 6% economic growth next year. According to the Ibrahim Index, over the last year, sustainable economic opportunity has improved in 41 African states, and human development has improved in 46 African states. In terms of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the MCC, and its programs and measurements, over half of the MCC's compacts are with African nations. Now, it's true that in order for a nation to qualify, it has to be have poverty. So there are many nations in Africa that are still impoverished and need to rise. But the reason there's a compact is because there are leaders in those countries who are devoted and dedicated and pledged to rising and making a difference and reforming. But I think the better answer to the question of whether democracy is delivering comes not from looking at the countries with which we have compacts, but instead looking at those countries that are trying to qualify for compacts, that are what we call threshold countries, threshold programs. And it's important because, as Connie said early on, you know, democracy is not the end of the game. Democracy is a process, and it's a long road. And as Americans, we have to be honest, we haven't always been perfect ourselves. We have made our share of mistakes. But we like to think that as Americans, we are on that road to democracy and always pushing forward. The threshold program is a recognition of countries in places like Africa that are on that road, that are seeking to reform and to rise and to make a difference. There are 10 African countries that are threshold countries, including Kenya. Kenya is a country that is qualified for a threshold program because it is clear that Kenya is pledging itself to reform and trying to make a difference for its people. It is not quite there yet in the sense of that indicator on corruption control. And so Kenya's threshold program is aimed at addressing the weaknesses in some aspects of its institutions, in records management, in public procurement. The threshold program involves helping Kenya with new technologies, the creation of public procurement oversight and staff training. It also funds television announcements created by the Kenyan government for the Kenyan people, that make the Kenyan people aware that they have someone to report to if they have concerns about waste or corruption. 
And when this is combined with Kenya's very exciting open data initiative, you can see that Kenya is a good partner and is on its way to reform and to rising. So I look at not the MCC compact countries, those that clearly have made huge progress, but I look at those who are on the way. And I think that's probably the best story in so many ways when we ask the question about whether democratic governance is, uh, is delivering. Again, to summarize, I think the obligation of Americans is to stand with our friends in Africa who have pledged themselves to strengthening democratic institutions because we recognize that this is a long and difficult process. We look at our own history and we see that it's a long and difficult process. But uh, I think most observers would agree that in many ways this is Africa's moment, that there is good news. There's a lot to be proud of. Clearly, there are places where there have been setbacks. But I think taken as a whole in the region, there's an awful lot of promise and hope and opportunity. And as friends of democracy and hopefully friends of Africa, I think we can play a role in providing some additional tools to help get the process done. Thank you. I'd like to really thank, thank the uh, Ambassador, Congressman, Board Chair, Member, because <laughs> there are a number of questions that I know you the audience is going to have, and if not, I have uh, several questions of you. But uh, what we're going to do is have the other speakers and then come back and have the, uh, the give and take. Uh, the next uh, speaker uh, is Excellency Ambassador Odimbo, who is the Kenyan Ambassador to the United States, and he previously served as Ambassador to France. But you can read that uh, in the program. I'm going to do the same thing I did with Ambassador Green. I'm, I went off schedule and off uh, remarks here. He, now, let me tell you about him. Um, he w was a graduate of Bowdoin, and in fact, I was a graduate of Bates, and I don't know what either one of us is doing up there in that coal. <laughs> um, there he was a biology major and a member of the soccer team. Now, the, the article didn't say whether he was any good, but he was a um, member of the soccer team. Um, but what did happen there uh, after he graduated was he received the 2010 Common Good Award um, because of his dedication throughout his career to um, improving the life of others through his work bringing development to rural and underprivileged in society. Also, the ambassador is on record as saying that all roads should lead investors to Africa. This, this means that he is the perfect person to be a member of this panel. It's going to resolve the issue of how to get uh, all investors on the road to Africa. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Newman, for your polite words. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank first the IRI for inviting me this morning to be with you, to speak, engage with you. I think this is my second time in the last uh, 11 months that I've been in the US. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge and appreciate my fellow Panelists, Ms. Newman, thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Green, Asante Sana, and of course my Deputy Mayor, uh, Mr. John Charo. Karibu Sana, DC. I'm also here with my colleague from the Embassy, Dennis Muhambe, who is a legal officer at, uh, at the Kenyan Embassy. Um, I liked the questions that uh, Ms. Newman asked at the beginning because uh, they, they 
give me sort of a starting point as well for my conversation and I'm also very happy that uh, Ambassador Green has mentioned the more Ibrahim governance uh, index as, as one of those indicators. So I would like to say upfront that I am absolutely sure and I'll say it without any fear of contradiction that yes, that Africa is on the rise and that yes, there is greater democratization and there is improved governance uh, across the continent. And it's more than just elections. Elections is a big part of it because we have not managed our elections very well over the last 50 years. And so if you were to do an assessment of how we have fared over the last 50 years, the results would be mixed. Um, and, and one of those places where it is very mixed is in the manner in which we have conducted ourselves around uh, elections. But I think we have gone as a continent beyond just having <coughs> free and fair elections. We like to think of them these days as fairly free and f fairly fair elections. Uh, and, but we want to move to just absolute free and fair elections. And I think we are on the road uh, to that. The media, particularly the international media, has not been very kind to us. But I have also realized in the 11 months that I've been here in Washington, the media is generally just not very polite and very nice to anybody. <laughs> so we shouldn't feel too badly. Why do I say this? Last year, for example, uh, on the continent there were at least nine presidential elections, or some 14. Uh, parliamentary elections and I distinguish between those two because I think it is very important that when we talk about democratization and improved governance that we look at the different arms uh, of government and the judiciary I think is a, is a very important part of government and that when we have elections the focus tends to be on presidential elections. Of the nine elections that took place last year, presidential 16 uh, parliamentary. We even had three referenda, one of which took place uh, uh, in Kenya for a new constitution. And I'll say something about that. Very little in the international, international media. The elections that we had about last year, the elections in the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire went wrong. And so that everybody knows about. But nobody is aware of the fact that there were several other presidential and parliamentary and referenda that took place. This year, up to this last month, uh, there have been some six presidential elections on the continent. And I would dare the people in the audience to name for me the six countries in which there have been presidential elections in the continent. The one that got some attention in the media was the Nigerian elections. And I think the Nigerian elections, if that is anything to go by, is a good indicator of the kind of progress. That's the largest country on the continent, 150, 160 million people, the, one of the largest economies, second only to <coughs> South Africa. So an election that takes place in Nigeria, free and fair, yes, there was some, some violence post-election up in the north because of this Christian-Muslim divide. But generally, they managed an election of a period of three weeks and it went fairly smoothly. And there was no contestation at all at the end of it. And good luck, Jonathan, today is uh, the president uh, of uh, Nigeria. Uh, so that gives me great hope. This year there was a referendum, South Sudan. Many, many, many people thought that it would not happen in January, that there was going to be violence, there was going to be... But it took place, an overwhelming vote by the people of southern Sudan. A week ago, they became an independent country. Yes, there are many pending issues. And I've said, and I've been on the record, that the time between the referendum and the 9th of July was a window that the international community did not <coughs> exert itself did not do everything that needed to be done because we had some serious pending issues at the time of the referendum in southern Sudan. The border issues, a BAE 
the oil and revenue, the issues in Darfur, those were big issues. They were left pending, and I think the window between January and July was not particularly well utilized by the international community. So those issues that have been weighty in the case of Sudan, I think on the 10th of July when Southern Sudan became an independent country, those issues are going to be a hundred times more difficult to manage now because we're dealing with two different countries. And a lot of the focus has been on Southern Sudan, the creation of a new nation. And again, I've argued that it, it is beyond that. I say that because I think we need to pay attention to the Sudan, uh, Khartoum and Juba both, because you can't yank off a third of a nation and think you've created a new nation with that one third and that what is left behind is the same nation. The government of Khartoum is also dealing with a new nation. And this needs to be paid attention to. There cannot be peace and progress in southern Sudan if there isn't peace and progress in Khartoum. And Khartoum is in risk because of the things that have been happening in the Middle East. The Muslim Brotherhood that everybody has been preoccupied with originated in the Sudan. Um, so the people in Khartoum are having to deal with a whole bunch of issues as well, in addition to the fact that there is now a new country down in the south. And I think southern Sudan and Khartoum will have to work very closely and the international community, IGA, the International Governmental, Intergovernmental Authority for Development, uh, I think will have to continue playing a very central role that it has played in the course of the CPA. I think if you look at the economics on the continent, again, that gives me great hope between 5 and 6 percent GDP annual growth rate consistently over the last 10 years, probably the only continent. And that, I think, is significant. If you read the McKinsey report of last year, it says, again, uh, without any contradiction, that the continent really is the place where all the action uh, will be. And, and I believe that's the case. There is improved governance on that continent. We are seeing not just elections, we are seeing improved constitutionalism. We are seeing multi-partism being exercised, yes, with some challenges, but we are seeing things happening. We are seeing greater citizen participation. I'm a great believer, having come from civil society myself, in the power of the people and citizens' organization, and particularly the youth. Ambassador Green has mentioned the youth. I have great hopes because of the youth. It is a completely different world that Africans who are 20 years old live in compared to the world that I lived in, that I grew up in 35, 40 years ago. And it is that youth, and if you look at the continent through the lenses of the youth, you will see that what they see and what the older people see are completely two different worlds. And they are going to push and they are going to insist on their participation, not just in the politics, in the economics and the social, elements of government, they want to be a part of it in every sense of the way. And I see across the continent, if you look at the regional blocks, uh, the African Union, for one. Again, uh, Ambassador Green has talked about the Imo Ibrahim. It is unusual. African heads of state and government can sit down today and talk about governance issues. Governance used to be a dirty word on the continent just 10 years ago, believe it or not. The moment you talked about governance, the moment you talked about civil society, you had governments that would be, they would just go ballistic completely. Civil society was, you know, elements of foreign powers that want to infiltrate and take over governments and blah, 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 and so forth. Not so. I watch African heads of state and government today in their meetings in the AU, and they're comfortably talking about governance issues. They're coming together and resolving issues in countries. Before, it was very difficult for African heads of state and government to point a finger at errant governments, and there have been many. We're not quite there yet, but if you look at the progress in just the last 10 years, and the way to monitor that is to watch the discussions and the outputs that come out of the AU summits. It is very significant. If you take a look at the minutes and the records and the resolutions of AU summits, 
in the last two, three years. Compared to the AU summits of six or seven years ago, you'll see a significant difference. They're more authoritative, they're more confident in terms of addressing issues of governance. They're talking boldly about the economic recovery that needs to take place, the enabling environment that needs to be created for the private sector. An open and a free media. That's something that you never talked about 10 years ago. Governments were completely uncomfortable with the idea of free media. Um, and so those things, get, and again, across the continent, if you look uh, in all the regions, in Southern Africa, in Eastern Africa, Central, West, and also up North, you'll see a significant increase in the freedom of the press and the media, things being said, being put up in the media, being put in the public domain that a few years uh, just would be unheard of. Uh, so those are the things that give me uh, hope, the rule of law, if you look at it, and I will I look at, uh, speak a little bit about Kenya and, and why I am uh, very hopeful uh, about the things that are taking place. We promulgated a new constitution last August, almost a year ago. Um, it is not only a new constitution, it's a very good constitution, if you ask me a very strong Bill of Rights, and as someone who has worked in community organization and human rights for a good part of my life, I can say very confidently that we have a very robust Bill of Rights. We have even enshrined in our constitution the basic social needs of human beings, the things that human beings need to live a life of dignity, food, water, education, shelter. We have enshrined those in our constitution. Issues of disability, the gender issues, very, very well addressed in the constitution. The other thing that we've done that I'm particularly proud of that gives me, and I've, I'm told that no less than 10 different African countries have come to visit us to, to look at our constitution and that whole process that we went through, particularly in light of the fact that just three years ago, uh, we came very close to destroying ourselves, the post-election violence that Ambassador Green came to uh, witness. Um, we have separated the powers. The executive arm of government, the legislature, and the judiciary. A big, big disease on the continent over the years. I just, I've never understood it. How such a fundamental element in democracy has been overlooked. That you have a parliament, a legislature, out of which you also pick your government. The cabinet in most African governments in all, most African systems, you have members of parliament who are part of the, the legislature who also then double up and are also cabinet ministers. It's such a fundamental flaw, but we somehow allowed it to happen. Uh, so we have managed to, do, to, to separate those very clearly. You cannot be a member of parliament and also be a member of the cabinet. Uh, and that, I think, is going to make a big difference. We have in the judiciary, we have overhauled the judiciary. And again, I don't know how many countries in the world have managed to stop the clock and say, starting here, we are completely starting with a new judiciary. Just three weeks ago, we appointed a new chief justice in the Republic of Kenya in full view of Kenyans. It was a competitive process. There was a panel that was put together. All the media were in the room. Kenyans were watching it as it took place. <coughs> Chief Justice, the Deputy Chief Justice, and the Director of Public Prosecution. And I talk about that because, again, in many instances when we talk about issues of governance and democratization, the judiciary is rarely ever mentioned. And yet it is the fulcrum around which everything evolves. We've had executive arms of government that have misbehaved because of an ineffective judiciary. We have legislatures that have misbehaved. We have elections that have gone wrong because of an ineffective judiciary. We have corruption that has been rampant because people can get away with it. We have insecurity because police can afford to be corrupt because the judicial process takes forever. So nobody is concerned about having to go before a judge. We used to have a joke in Kenya some years ago that if you get into serious, serious trouble, don't bother to pay a lawyer, pay a judge. <laughs> That's how bad it was. 
We've put in place with the new constitution a judicial service commission that has in turn been responsible for now the judicial overhaul that we are undergoing. In the next two months, the entire judiciary, all our judges and magistrates are going to have to resign. They are going to have to reapply for their jobs. And only those who pass that vetting process will get their jobs back. The new Chief Justice, who by the way, I've worked with in civil society for many years, his last job was the East Africa representative for the Ford Foundation. He headed the Kenya Human Rights Commission for many years. He headed the Constitutional Coalition, the Coalition for Constitutional Change in Kenya, civil society groups, consistent. He beat senior judges, people who have worked in the judiciary for 30, 40 years, hands down, because the Judicial Service Commission was determined that if we were really going to clean up the judicial service, the, the judicial system, that we really needed to do something drastic. And they did. So we had a Chief Justice that appeared before a panel with even a stud on one ear, and that became a national debate. <laughs> oh my goodness, this man is coming close to getting the job of Chief Justice, and he wears a stud on his, what, right or right, I can't remember, I think, really wears a stud on one ear. That became a national debate, and it was a very good one. <laughs> because it brought out all sorts of other things about our society that needed to come out of it. But anyway, so there we are, a new judiciary, in his first meeting with the senior judges in the Republic, just a few uh, weeks ago. He sat down with 50 of them and said, this is the time, the change is coming, and I encourage you all to work with me, and again, those of you who know uh, that you have served this nation well, you have nothing to fear. But those of you who know you have a blemish in your record, I will urge you to spare yourself and your loved ones a lot of agony because we are going to take you through a process that might not be particularly present. Um, so I am hopeful. A number of African countries are looking at what is going on in Kenya. The process of enacting the legislation that needs to be enacted in order for us to operation, fully operationalize the, Kenyan, the new Kenyan, the Kenyan constitution uh, is going a bit slow because there are still vested interests. There are still people who are resisting. But up to where we have gone now, I think there is no uh, turning back, and I'm particularly hopeful. And I'm very happy, finally, that also a very significant element of this Constitution is the devolution of power. We have devolved power from the center for too long. Too much power, too much authority, too much mandate and resources by Nairobi. Nairobi has less than 10% of Kenya's population, of 40 million people, uh, and owns more than 70% of the nation's wealth. Part of the poverty that we see in the nation is because the resources that are in the center find it very difficult to trickle to the periphery. That has been changed, so we have not only devolved, previously we had what we were calling a decentralized system of government, but it was decentralized but run from the center didn't make sense, fundamental contradiction. Yeah. But now we have devolved power, we will have county governments, the equivalent of your state governments here with the county legislatures, county governors, county legislatures. <laughs> and we are also going to have an upper house, again similar to your Senate here, to check on parliament as well because we have noticed from time to time parliament having these roguish tendencies, so we figured that they need to be checked on as well. And that devolution, I think, in terms of enhancing people's participation, I think that is going to be extremely important. Significant resources, 15% of the national budget allocated directly to the devolved systems of government. Devolved systems of government can conduct business, even international business, and I think that is going to be significant. Education, healthcare, livestock, agriculture, extension services are going to be devolved to the county level and I think that again people will be closer to where important decisions are being made people will be able to participate more effectively uh, and I think those can only be good things uh, for Kenya and so I thank you very much for, for listening to me. I'd like to thank the ambassador so much for the uh, informative and uh, hopeful report.
on Kenya. I was the um, U.S. head of the IRI delegation there for the election, and it's yeah, and it is very. Um, it's just very good news, uh, your report, and, and particularly the impact uh, that the Constitution and the participation of the people in, in uh, bringing about a new Constitution is just, it's good news for Africa. Um, now our final um, panelists, uh, Deputy Mayor and Charles has been in uh, municipal council since 2002 and was reelected uh, as a way that a lot of people would like to be reelected as deputy mayor unopposed for his uh, second second term um, his time on the council has included addressing difficult and pleasant matters but of the <coughs> former He's had to take uh, the lead in addressing water shortages, instituting a smoking ban in uh, public places, a very difficult problem of address uh, dealing with displaced uh, young girls. Um, on the other hand, uh, he went on a boondoggle. Uh, they call it uh, Sister City um, meeting in Long Beach, California. <laughs> took a delegation. I'm sure there was a lot of serious business took, <laughs> took place there. But most important for this audience uh, to know is that the uh, deputy mayor has been instrumental in guiding the municipal council of Mombasa in its efforts to institute uh, democratic governance uh, within the council. And so with that, we look forward um, to hearing from you, deputy mayor. Thank you so much, uh, Connie. That's, that's my wife's name. <laughs> uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, this issue of governance, but uh, I will be talking more about uh, my city of Mombasa and how our partnership with the uh, IRI has done wonders to governance issues in Mombasa. And uh, I'll also give you an insight on how local authorities work in Mombasa, the kind of legislation we've been using, whether it's been effective or not. And I'm also going to spend some time telling you how the new constitution, which has been described by Ambassador Odembo very well, how it gives us hope on improving governance issues in Kenya and particularly in the city of Revenge of Mombasa. Local authorities in Mombasa, in Kenya, operate under a local government act, CAP 265 of the laws of Kenya. This is a colonial law which was inherited by the, from the British government. And the, the, the sad thing is that uh, the British government did away with this piece of legislation so many years ago but we stuck to it for 40 years, and it has not served us very well. It was only the other day that we realized that we have to do something about it, and we have actually done something about it, which I'm going to talk about later on. <coughs> Meanwhile, let me tell you a little bit about Mombasa. Mombasa is the second largest city in Kenya, and it's the second largest municipality in the country. It is a port city located in the southeastern part of the country, it has a population of about 1.5 million people, although government statistics indicate that the population is about 950,000. But I'm in the business of serving residents on a day-to-day -day basis, and I know that the government statistics are wrong. We are well above 1.5 million. And if there's one city in Kenya that is suffering from rural urban migration most, that is Mombasa. People like coming to Mombasa for different reasons, um, mostly they come, uh, they are attracted by the activities at the port, but it's also a tourist resort, and uh, some come for holiday and stick there, 
there's a saying in uh, Kenya that uh, it's easy to come to Mombasa but so difficult to leave the town. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, uh, when you take statistics on rural urban migration, uh, Mombasa is affected most. So the population keeps on doubling every 10 years. So in another 10 years, we expect the population of Mombasa to be about 3 million people. So you can imagine the challenges that come with uh, this kind of uh, population influx. Well, back to the local government act that uh, we have been operating on. Uh, Mombasa is divided into 32 electoral wards, which brings about uh, that we bring, which brings 32 councillors to form the civic wing of the municipal council. We have uh, another 12 nominated councillors coming in, and the nominated councillors are usually uh, chosen from uh, re with regards to the strength of the political parties. Uh, political parties uh, uh, that uh, participated in the general election. But with Mombasa, um, all the councillors belong to the Orange Democratic Party, so it was the Orange Democratic Party that nominated all the nominated councillors. That's it, those are 12. Adding the 12 to the 32 elected councillors, we have the civic wing composed of about 44 councillors. Apart from the civic wing, we have the administrative wing of the council, which is held, which is led by the town clerk. The, um, you, the, in American cities, you call him the town manager or city manager. That's the equivalent of a town clerk in, uh, in, in, in Kenya. So what the, what the act says is that we have two wings that run the council, the civic wing and the administrative wing. The civic wing is headed by the mayor and myself as a deputy, and the administrative wing is headed by the town clerk and his chief officers. Um, the relationship between the administrative wing and the civic wing is one similar to uh, the board of directors of a company and the management. The civic wing dictates and formulates policies and the administrative wing implements those policies. Now, that sounds very well, but uh, it, does, it hasn't served us very, uh, quite uh, efficiently because um, it's the central government that appoints the town clerk or the city manager. And it's the same central government that appoints the chief officers. So if the town clerk fails to perform as per the uh, dictated policies of the civic wing, there's really nothing the mayor can do to the town clerk, apart from make a lot of noise. But there's really nothing he can do. And the trend in Kenya has been that the civic wing comes up with very good pro-people policies, and you have a rogue town clerk who doesn't bother to implement those good policies and uh, reforms, and nothing usually happens to him. And this has been a big problem. I'm not saying it has been a problem in Mombasa, but generally in the, in the, in the country it has been a very, very big problem because you cannot do anything to this person who is bringing back development and other governance issues that are pro-people and are supposed to improve the lives of the citizens of that particular town. That was one of the major reasons why the whole system was reformed. So the administrative wing has chief officers who manage different departments in the council, such as education, the housing department, the town treasurer's department, the town planning department, the public health care department, engineering department, etc. And uh, Mombasa has a good we, we run the health department parallel with the central government because we have about uh, 13, 13 operating health centers spread around the city. And uh, we built about 10 others uh, in the last two years using money from the central government. And uh, we use the same uh, legislation that is used by the central government in running our, our health services. But again, we've been having um, major problems um, with uh, employment and staffing of these clinics, so nothing much has been happening to, to the people. Uh, I will tell you something that is a bit, more, a bit shameful. We, ten years ago, we had a population of Mombasa, the population of Mombasa was about 800,000, and the staffing at the council was about 5,400 members of staff. That was 10 years ago. Now we have a population of 1.5 million people. There has been uh, a reduction in the staff. Uh, people have died, retired, 
some have been sat, some have gone to uh, for greener pastures elsewhere. We now have a population of 1.5 million, but the workforce has shrunk, and we have uh, about 2,400 workers only. So when you come to Mombasa, there's a big, big challenge as to, as, as to service delivery because one of the biggest problems is that we have not been able to employ people commensurate with the increase in population of the city. And the central government knows this. And the central government is doing nothing about it. And uh, we keep on suffering. And our only hope towards a better future is with the new constitution, which has totally overhauled the way we do things and has cut us off from the central government stranglehold. We can now make decisions. We can now employ our own people as and when we need them. We can make decisions without going back to Nairobi. We can employ, we can borrow money to do serious development projects without talking or referring to Nairobi with a new constitution. And I think that's a very, very good thing because most of the problems, uh, we know where the shoe pinch is, and we make recommendations as to how we can improve on the on, on, on particular issues that are not pro people. But again, approval has to come from Nairobi, and somebody just decides he's not giving the approval, and the rest of the citizens in our towns continue to suffer. It's a big problem um, that has affected our performance over the years. And I'm happy, again, and I keep mentioning it, that our biggest, biggest, biggest uh, uh, consolation is the coming up with a new constitution where we're going to have a governor and most decisions will be done in Mombasa and finalized in Mombasa. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I wish to, to speak very briefly on the difficulties that we have had with the, with, the, with the system. I've just mentioned a few. I've talked about the town clerk and how he can be difficult and uh, in, uh, impede on uh, service delivery. Let me talk about the mayor and the deputy. <laughs> the mayor is elected by the councillors. Councillors are elected by the people, they come to the council and they elect the mayor and the deputy. But then again, in most cases, I'm not saying Mombasa, but in most cases, uh, the, the mayor becomes more loyal, more obedient and pays more attention to the councillors who elected him rather than to the residents of the city. That has been a very, very big problem. Um, yeah, maybe we, <laughs> maybe it affects me too. But. Uh, you pay more attention to the councillors because they can throw you out any time. And we have, they have to elect the mayor and the deputy every two years. So if they're not your friends and if you're not close to them, they'll kick you out in the first two years. I've managed to survive. I don't know whether it's because I'm close to them, or, but I've tried to pay attention to the residents of the Mombasa and at the same time pay attention to them because they are the people who, who elect me. But I think that was a big flaw in the way we do our business there because you cannot have councillors electing mayors. I don't know whether the system uh, has worked anywhere else in the world, but it has been a big, big failure in the Kenyan local governance system. And I'm happy again to say that we are doing away with that. And I was just re-elected uh, about two, three weeks ago, and I'm glad that was the last election I had to go through, because now I can focus on the citizens of Mombasa and pay very little attention to the councillors. Well, the chief officers, again, with the system that we have had, um, <coughs> they are a confused lot. They don't know whether to take instructions from the town clerk or from the mayor. It's not very clear. There's, okay, in, on paper, they're supposed to take instructions from the town clerk, but uh, we also have the mayor and the deputy who also have, uh, who see issues and think differently, although we are supposed to be policy makers, but we also like to have our hands on day-to-day -day activities at the council. So you talk to a chief officer, you tell him that I think this has to be done as far as waste management is concerned. The town clerk thinks differently, and there we have a confused person, and that confused person leads to uh, less performance in uh, service delivery because he doesn't know who to take instructions from. So those are, those are the few flaws that we've, be, we've had with the, with, with, the, with the present system. And the, again, there is very little 
or no public participation in making decisions based on governance and service delivery, delivery except on budget day. We have budget, a budget day every year, and that's the only time we invite stakeholders and members of the public to, to tell us on how they want us to run the city. And I think that's so insufficient. Imagine once a year is when we talk to the people and uh, engage them in, uh, in, uh, in asking them on, on how best to, we, they expect us to, or they want us to run the city. So again, we are doing away with this thing. This was, uh, it's, I mean, to me is history. We are now in transition and we are changing the way we are doing business. And um, I'm just hoping that uh, we, we, will, we will be more, we'll be, engage, we'll be engaging more with the, the, the residents of our cities to run our, our, country, our country much better. Last year, as has been uh, well mentioned by the ambassador, we, Kenya promulgated the new constitution, which divided the country into 47 counties, Mombasa being one of them. Although the new order stipulates that local authorities, which existed prior to the coming of the new constitution, will continue to exist, it is very clear now that all governance issues at the local level will be controlled by the governor. The governor will just appoint the mayor according to the new constitution and the mayor will be a ceremonial figure doing ceremonial duties for the town. But uh, the governor will be the CEO of the county and he will be the one to perform or deliver all the services previously executed by the municipal council. All the employees of the council will, in the local authorities will be moved to the county government and execute functions allocated to the county government and draw salaries from the county government. However, there will be some representatives of the national government at the county level who will remain employees of the national government, like those that are popularly known as the provincial administration. Kenya is divided into eight provincial uh, districts. We have eight provinces. Mombasa is in the coast province and is headed by a provincial commissioner. And then we have district commissioners under him, and then we have uh, district officers under the district commissioner, then we have chiefs under the district officers and assistant chiefs. That's how, and they all report to the office of the president. The new constitution says that they'll continue to exist, but they, they will, it's not very clear whether they'll be reporting to the governors in place or whether they'll still, reporting to, they'll still be reporting to the central government and what exactly their functions will be. What is clear is the, government, the governor will be in control of everything. So maybe um, they will, continue um, working for the central government, but at the same time simultaneously reporting to the governor on issues of uh, that regard that uh, uh, are to do with the security and uh, yeah, I think just security because there's really nothing much uh, they'll be doing. Everything has been given to the governor. <coughs> so the constitution gives the county as the lower unit, but it also does does not stop counties from creating lower units within it. So each county is free to have as many subunits as possible down the line. But I don't see that happening so much because number one, Africans don't like sharing power that much. <laughs> number two, number two, if you have many subunits, then it becomes very expensive and difficult. Uh, government uh, uh, financially, it, uh, the financial burdens that come with uh, subun sub the subunits to be created would be immense and it will. You'll, you'll find yourself spending money that you'd have actually used to, to improve the lives of the residents. Um, you'll find yourself uh, incurring a lot of money in recurrent expenditures, paying salaries and whatnot. So I don't see that happening, but the law allows us to create as many subunits as possible from the county. The reporting level of the subunits will be to the county governor and the county government, and not the ministry as was previously the case. The powers of the national government and the county governments are clearly defined in the new constitution. Both these governments are formatted on a presidential system. I think we borrowed a lot from, from the US, South Africa, and I think uh, Canada. So, let me now speak on the relationship the IRI has had with, uh, with, with Mombasa. Well, as I indicated earlier, the local government set up previously had its shortcomings and challenges. 
it was important to see how, in spite of these challenges, services that are required are still delivered to the people. And as a pilot project, the IRI in Kenya came up with, six, with a six-month program, the first in Kenya, it was done in Mombasa, to train and educate councillors on governance issues. I'm happy to note that the mayor, my boss, His Worship, Councillor Ahmed Modar and myself were instrumental in launching the IRI's activities on local governance program in Mombasa. And I also wish to state that all councillors demonstrated a willingness and commitment to strengthening governance and improve service delivery in the town. It started off uh, as, a, as, as a simple program, but uh, later on I'm glad to note that uh, the leadership in Mombasa took the program with a lot of seriousness and it has uh, actually achieved what it intended to achieve because um, it left the, uh, the councillors uh, at, at different people. We, 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 we were actually now connected to the residents and uh, unlike the past when we were so detached, as I indicated earlier, we could hardly see eye to eye with uh, most of the people that we are supposed to be represented to. The program was extremely successful, uh, successful, as I said, and has contributed to far-reaching reforms in the running of our city. Conflict between the civic wing and the administrative wing has now almost disappeared. We used to quarrel every day with the administrative wing, almost on a daily basis. But uh, the program uh, led by the IRI in, the, in Mombasa has brought us closer. We now, um, We, we now know what the left hand is doing, the right hand knows what the left hand is doing, and vice versa. And uh, we've hardly had any conflicts in the last one year. And this is uh, greatly due to the program that uh, actually brought the two wings of the council together and showed them ways of working in harmony and geared to doing pro-people projects and making pro-people decisions. Um, was with, the, with, the, with, the, with the IRI program, we, 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 were very, we, were, we were made to sit with the residents on a day, uh, now at least a monthly basis, uh, making decisions with them, uh, deciding on issues with them, Uh, telling them the, our story because there are certain things that are, they are blaming us but they are actually beyond our control. Um, telling them why waste management has been a problem. Showing them that we are actually short of funds. Showing them the difficulties that we are having. And they came to appreciate our position. They came to appreciate that we are having difficulties in, in the services that are actually due to them. And uh, this came out very clearly because the IRI program brought the citizens and the, and, and the residents together. The program also tried to get the civil society and the politicians in the council together. And this has been very difficult because, um, I don't know, I will disagree with uh, my ambassador. Um, civil society hardly sits with, uh, hardly sees eye to eye with politicians in Kenya. This is mainly because uh, most people in civil society are actually using civil society as a springboard to politics. So when you try to bring politicians and the civil society together, especially in Kenya, um, it's like bring, uh, putting, a, you get a spark. People quarrel because you're actually putting opponents together. And this is uh, indicative because in the parliament that is sitting in Nairobi now, half of the members are from civil society. They used civil society to spring. So if you want, it's a good idea on paper to bring civil society and politicians to discuss issues that are going to affect governance of the people. But in Kenya particularly, it's so difficult because you're actually bringing, uh, I can't sit with Connie if Connie wants to be the mayor next year, <laughs> if she wants my seat. How can I sit with Connie to discuss issues? I find, I, 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 and Connie can't, Connie will never have kind words for me. I might not have kind words for Connie. And that has been so difficult. And I think that one of the biggest challenges with the IRI program is to bring us politicians at the council to talk and work with civil society. But uh, again, there's a Mr. Scott Poole in Kenya. He's been very adamant and he has actually managed to bring us together. We are now talking, we are now discussing issues. 
and uh, most of the most of most most of what they most of the ideas they give us as civil society are now slowly but surely being implemented, and uh, of course the biggest beneficiaries are the residents of Mombasa. Most of the councillors present will be in the new county government next year. And the challenge, is now, challenge now is to equip these managers with the required skills in order for them to be more accountable and efficient in delivering services under the new political and administrative uh, dispensation. I'm glad to know that the IRA team in Kenya is now holding high-level discussions with uh, His Worship the Mayor of Mombasa, myself, so as to come up with a program that will prepare the leadership of Mombasa for the new administrative functions. God willing, this program will be equally successful as the first one that uh, brought us uh, together with the civil society and the residents, and where it's now actually working very, very well, and the beneficiaries, at the end of the day, are ourselves as the, politi as the politicians and the residents of Mombasa. So does the democratic governance exist in Kenya? I won't talk about Africa. Well, the answer is yes. Is it delivering? Well, yes, with the new constitution it will deliver and with, it, with increased partnership between ourselves at, as politicians and the IRI in Kenya. So thank you very, thank you very much and I might ask, 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 answer some questions that are going to arise from what I've just indicated. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I actually would have a kind word to say, uh, given that excellent presentation. I, so you need not worry about that. Uh, I think what I'd like to do now, yeah, no. I, I was hearing echo, which is why I turned it off. I think what I'd like to do now is to say that the balance of the time is your time. That what we want is for you to not just ask questions, but share your observations. Uh, it would be helpful if you have a particular panelists that you want to hear from that you let us let me know who that is. But other than that, um, I think uh, we are more interested in hearing from you and your uh, thoughts and um, answering your questions if you have questions. So let's. Um, Who's first? Great. I'm uh, Gregory Simpkins. I used to work here at IRI. In fact, back in the 20th century when I was here, we had a program called the African Democracy Network. And in fact, uh, Your Honor, we had a meeting, a major meeting in Mombasa. And one of the outcomes of our meetings uh, was a consensus that um, Democracy isn't uh, is different in every country, but also that uh, democracy should be from the ground up instead of the top down, which too often it is in Africa. And I wanted to ask the entire panel. I'm, I'm sorry, I want to let everybody ask, answer this: Is it too late to build democracy in African countries from the bottom up, as as opposed to how it's been done? Uh, I note in um, in um, uh, Botswana, they have a House of Chiefs, and I think uh, His Excellency, the the Ambassador, talked about uh, the new Constitution and how it includes um, chiefs. So, can can we reverse the mistakes of the past? Ambassador, you want perhaps we take a number of them together? Because you can. We can do. Thank you. I'm Perry from IRI Uganda. Um, I have a question for the ambassador. I wanted to know to whom would you attribute the changes taking place in Kenya and why? Because I know like Uganda we have a very good constitution but we're not moving as fast. Thank you. One more and then uh, we'll try to answer. Yeah. 
Um, hello, my name is Lars uh, Benson, and I'm with the Center for International Private Enterprise. And <clears throat> I think uh, all of the panelists uh, briefly touched on this, but the question of corruption. How do you combat corruption um, from local government point of view, from a national point of view? Uh, it remains a big issue in, in Africa. And in Kenya, I'd like to hear maybe about different approaches that have been successful in terms of addressing this important issue. Thank you. Ambassador, let's start with you and then move down the table this way. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for those uh, questions. Um, is it too late to build it from, from the bottom up? Um, I think if you look at the examples of the things that have taken place on the continent, if it is entirely from the top up, it is not sustainable. So inevitably, what we are seeing is that even if it originates from the top, somewhere along the line, the bottom has to meet the top. And, and that meeting point, I think, is critical for a number of African countries. Uh, but we are also seeing uh, the wave that we've just seen uh, in the Middle East uh, is, you know, people deciding it's time for change, enough is enough, uh, and taking it upon themselves. There was no formula. Nobody would have predicted. Social scientists would not have predicted. Political scientists would not have predicted just a few months ago what is, what is taking place in the Middle East now. Uh, and I think we're in that situation as well in a number of African countries where uh, it will take a spark in some cases and you will see a ground swelling of citizens just deciding that the time has come. And, and it will be very difficult to resist those changes. Uh, but by and large, what we are seeing is that uh, when we have leaders who mean well, um, they can't do it alone. It does require that there is a certain amount of citizens' participation uh, because it goes, it, it goes both ways. Yeah? And, I, and I think that's partly the answer to the situation in Uganda. Yes, you might have had a good constitution. You must remember that in the Kenyan situation, this process started more than 20 years ago. We didn't wake up one day and have a new constitution. We've been at it since 1990. And so it has been slow, it has been painful, it has been gradual. Many people lost their lives in this process. Um, and, and to some extent, uh, to respond to your question, the, the coalition government is a blessing in, in disguise as well. It was a compromise situation. As you know, coalition governments are difficult to manage, even in the best of times. Ours was not created in the best of times. Ours was created in a situation where things had gone really, really bad. But what has happened is that because we have two very strong competing powers, uh, there is an inbuilt checks and balances so each side is checking on the other. So this whole constitution review process, you must remember that we, we had a constitutional conference in 2003, 2004, that ended with a referendum in 2005. That was thrown out by the citizens because the powers that be sort of tweaked the constitution that had come out of the constitutional conference. And so the citizens rejected it. So to a large extent, we had already been through this process. And the level of constitutional awareness in the republic is extremely high. I test that by calling my mother every so often to find out. And last year, just before the referendum, I would call my mother on the phone. And she would talk to me about she and her women's groups in the village are discussing different chapters of the constitution. That said something to me. When my 80-year-old woman can sit down under a tree with her friends and talk about different parts of the Constitution, I think that is part of what it took for us to get to where it, it was a long process. Uh, the first Constitutional Review Conference uh, Committee Commission uh, actually went throughout the whole republic. They went to all the 210 constituencies and met with people and talked with people about the kind of constitution that they wanted. So there's a very significant ownership of this constitution by, by many Kenyans. Uh, uh, corruption, I think I'll let uh, the mayor uh, take that from the bottom, but, but I've mentioned the fact that I think the having an, effect, an effective judicial system, uh, the one that I'm hoping that we will have, 
is a big part in fighting impunity and, and corruption. But let me hand it over to Ma'am Charo. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, the reason why we don't talk about corruption so much in, 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 uh, in our country right now is because the level of corruption is, is actually going down. We had a lot of corruption during the Kenyatta, Jomo Kenyatta government, Jomo Kenyatta administration. When uh, President uh, Moi came to power, it was actually perfected to so serious then. I passed through a park on my way here. Um, Mark, what's the name of that park? Where's Mark? Yeah, now can you imagine that park, somebody getting a title deed for it? and calling it his own. Things were that bad in, our, in my country. Public parks were being grabbed from, and somebody just has a title deed. And if you take that person to court, the law says that all title deeds will be respected, so can't do anything about it. We've come so far. Things don't work that way nowadays. We have the Kibaki administration, and we, we came up with the, the Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission that has done a very, very good job in stamping corruption from public offices, right from the local authority up to the central government. They have not been very successful because they, don't have, they didn't have prosecutorial powers. Um, what, what, what now happens is they used to... They, they, they investigate a case, they take it to the Attorney General, and the Attorney General is supposed to now do the prosecutions. But if the Attorney General is your friend, that's, that's the end of the story. The file dies there. I keep talking about the new constitution because it gives us hope. It has changed that. It has separated the office of the Attorney General from the, the Director of Public Prosecution. Those are different departments now. Those are different offices now. And what happens is they are giving Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission prosecutorial powers. So if they investigate you on corruption issues, they can either send your file to the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions for you to be prosecuted, or they can prosecute you themselves. It's an arrangement that was there in South Africa, and it put so many ANC people inside until they had to do away with it. I, I don't know whether we're going to reverse it, but that's what is happening in our country. We have actually empowered the Anti-Corruption Commission to, be, to have even bigger jaws, not even teeth. So we're not talking about it because we're having a relief now. Things are much, much better now. Not unlike the, uh, during the uh, 80s and 70s when people used to do whatever it is they wanted and they used to, they used to get away with it. Again, the ambassador has mentioned that we, we have actually radically changed our, our judiciary. We have sucked everybody. All the, only the, the, the competent and corruption-free judges are applying back. The rest have actually gone gone away to do some other things. So we are not talking about it because it's a disease we are healing from. We don't even like thinking about it. And I think we have done a good job. And that's why I always talk about the new constitution because it gives us hope and it has taken care of most of the perennial problems that the country has been suffering from, especially corruption. Um, you know, Greg, I think the, the real question on, or, or I think the importance of your question in talking about whether or not uh, bottom-up change in democracy can be built. First off, it's the recognition that one of the challenges that Africa has faced, many parts of Africa anyway, is having to operate on a system which was imposed upon them. In so many parts of Africa, you had generation after generation growing up in a constitutional system that was created by outside forces especially in the case of European colonies. And those systems were created to impose control from centralized capitals. And so it really has taken a long time for that to um, sort of melt away. So I think that's the challenge that Africa has faced in many ways. I think the most hopeful sign of change, though, is the spread of technology. There was a time, again, I alluded to it, in, in my days in Kenya, where my students couldn't have imagined challenging the central government. I mean, it, it, it was simply not a question, not an issue, and they had no tools to do so. But with the radical spread of simple cost-effective technologies, it's changed everything. And what I was struck by in my days as ambassador in Tanzania was watching the people's reaction to high-level resignations that were actually as a result of 
the uh, exposition of corruption. I was um, truly impressed with how engaged uh, the populace was on the accountability of officials, and it really gave me a sense of, of hope. And that technology, again, I think has made all the difference in the world. Um, in terms of fighting corruption, again, I think technology is absolutely key um, because the technology is not only creating a sense of awareness and connecting various communities, but secondly, it is creating an opportunity for transparency that is remarkable. Perhaps the single most uplifting moment that I had as ambassador was the inauguration of what we call the public expenditure tracking system, which is actually a, a manifestation of an MCC threshold program in Tanzania, where we did something fairly simple, which was to um, inaugurate a glass bulletin board behind which a um, local budget was posted a lockable glass bulletin board. The budget had been transmitted from the capital to this village and it was put behind this bulletin board. And my job as ambassador was twofold. Was number one, to pull back the curtain on the budget, literally, and secondly, to recognize uh, particularly um, the women who had demanded the transparency that got us there. And I remember it because um, I was handing out certificates of appreciation and again a lot of the leaders that had uh, brought us to that day were Tanzanian women who had never had a sense of, of a window onto a budget or a sense of empowerment of being able to hold leaders accountable. So I was handing out these certificates and as was very often the case a, a mother came to me, she got her certificate and in very traditional form, you know, she, she shook hands with me holding her hand and coming down on one knee as a sign of respect. As I turned to walk away, I heard this scream and this whoop and I turned around and she was dancing with the certificate in the air because for the first time ever she was empowered. She had the information, she had the window on the budget, and that public expenditure tracking system, that taxpayer group, was able to create a sense of awareness and accountability. That's why I'm very hopeful in, in the battle against corruption. As, as challenging as it is, the spread of technology and information, the fact that people can gather uh, more easily than before, and the fact that we're seeing more and more countries uh, take a look at the structure of government and recognize they need to develop their own structure, not a colonial structure, not a, a modification of a, of a colonial structure, but that one that suits culture and history. So, you know, long way to go, but I'm very hopeful in a number of places. On the corruption issue, I'd like to just reinforce and make one a final uh, observation. First is you have to have a strong judiciary. You have to have a free and strong press. And you have to uh, you have to have a strong civil society. I, I guess I'm um, don't know where I am with you on this subject bit because I I think that some of our strong around the world and best uh, legislators are the people who've come out of civil society. And even if they are competing, sometimes politicians need them to compete with them. But the final uh, observation I want to make, and it's probably an obvious one, which is uh, people who are hungry cannot fight. So poverty, corruption uh, can really only be addressed when there are enough people who are out of poverty and, and uh, the a more um, midstream in order to take on the system. So I don't think often people say, well, you need, to, you need to straighten up the government and get the corruption out of the way before you start investing, um, before you start putting aid in. But I'm, I think you have to run it parallel because until you have enough people who are strong and are not worried every day about uh, where their next meal is going to come from, you're not really going to be able to have any strong way of uh, in influencing the system. But we have time for two more questions. 
I don't know if we'll have time for the answers, but no, I'm just, he, uh, one back here and then one over here. Yes, sir. Dr. Komi, and I'm from Ghana, but I've lived in Nigeria and Ivory Coast. And I just came back from Ghana, living there for the last three months. My question goes to the ambassador. He says something about the AU. What is the AU about? Is it really representing the African people? And also, you mentioned that when it comes to our, our uh, constitutions in Africa, in Ghana, the constitution mandates 50% of the cabinet ministers said it must come from the parliament. So the last uh, 20 years or so, it's not working. What can we do about it? And one, one question over here. My name is Charles Littlefield, and I'm the program officer for Nigeria. Um, I've been program officer for a year. Before that, I was director in our field office in Guatemala for about three years, where we did good governance, local level good governance. Uh, my question is mainly for the deputy mayor, thinking back to Guatemala. One of the biggest challenges I found for all the local governments was tax collection. And uh, it was just really hard for them to, to act on any ideas because they just could, couldn't collect enough taxes locally. And so everything was basically dependent on transfers uh, from the national government and so forth. So I'm just curious, what, what kind of taxes uh, are you able to collect in the city of Mombasa? And also, you know, what challenges you might have. And also, how, how would this change now with um, the new counties that are going to be established? And, and since they'll be decentralized, they'll have to collect taxes as well. <clears throat> Let's start with the deputy mayor so I can give the ambassador time to think about the AU. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, Mombasa, we, we usually have a, a yearly budget of about... Uh, 2.5 billion Kenya shillings. I don't know how many dollars that is, but I can tell you after I, <laughs> I convert. But um, most of that uh, um, um, budget is financed by local taxes. Um, there's quite a bit that comes from the central government, but um, most of it, uh, that is about 70% of it, is actually collected locally. But uh, it, when you look at the, the city and what we collect, usually it's not enough. We have a port I, I told you Mombasa is a port city. Um, the municipal council doesn't get a single penny from all the activities that go on in the port. A single penny. All the money that is generated by the port goes to the central government. And that's a big, big problem because um, just the fact that we have a port, there are some major, major, major uh, maintenance expenses on the roads and infrastructure that go with the fact that there's a port there. Huge trucks that bring containers to, to, to the port and outside the port. They break our roads and we're supposed to maintain those roads. Yet, the money generated from the port, uh, the council doesn't get a single penny from it. And we've actually made a lot of noise on this issue for a very long time. Um, we also collect uh, uh, property rates, uh, but uh, we don't usually collect what we expect to collect. Like last year, we expected to collect about 300 million Kenya shillings, but we only ended up collecting 160, 170 million Kenya shillings. And uh, normally, our budgets are projected. The revenues, the re revenues that we expect to collect, are budgeted to pay salaries, do maintenance, buy more vehicles for. Uh, waste management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if you don't collect what you budgeted for, then of course you don't deliver on the, the promised uh, services to the, to the residents, and that has been a, a very big problem. Another problem is uh, government properties don't pay tax directly to the council. There's something called CELO, contribution in lieu of rates, whereby all the properties belonging to the government, government buildings, um, Navy, naval headquarters, army barracks, uh, the money that was supposed to come in terms of property rates, now we're supposed to collect it from the treasury in Nairobi. I can tell you for a fact that we have not been receiving that, that money for over eight years, so they owe us about a billion shillings, and they just don't pay. Now, back to the new constitution. Things have changed. <laughs> All government buildings, government institutions are supposed to pay directly to the treasurer, to the, to the treasurer of the governor, governor's office from now on, from next year. 
no more collecting money from the central government. So if the, if the naval headquarters doesn't pay its property rights for the Navy, we can, I think, uh, get the Navy commander in court, something like that. So things will start working. With KPA, uh, the new constitution puts it under the eyes of the central uh, government, but managed by the local authority, the governor's office. So most likely we'll be getting some money from there. And then uh, thirdly, um, the Kenya Revenue Authority is supposed to assist us in collecting all the other local taxes. So instead of collecting about 60 to 70 percent of the of the taxes, most likely we'll be collecting about 100 percent of the taxes because KRA collects almost everything it's supposed to collect. They're very very serious. So things have changed. That's why I always talk about the new constitution. It's a godsend. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, thank you very much. On on the question of of Ghana, I think um, I'm, I'm I'm very clear about this. You you have to separate the functions and the responsibilities of the legislature from those of the executive arm of government. Whether it's 25 percent of the cabinet that comes from the parliament or even 10 percent, I think there should be a complete separation. And people who sit in parliament should not sit in the cabinet. I'm absolutely clear about that. Uh, and I don't think we should make any compromises about that. I mean, it, it is part of what has bred the kind of corruption that we have seen, so that the executive becomes extremely powerful, because you have a situation where the executive is the one that appoints them from their cronies, members of parliament who they think will serve them well or have served them well in the past, and put them in cabinet positions. And with those cabinet positions come all manner of goodies and, 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 and privileges that, uh, that people fight and, and, and die for. So I think there should be a clear separation. People going to parliament should go to parliament, and then the cabinet should be, a, should be part of the executive arm of government and should be appointed separately. The African Union is a baby of the organization of African unity. And that came in the 50s, uh, and a big agenda for the OAU, as you will remember, was about fighting colonialism. You remember in the 50s and early 60s, quite a number of African countries uh, were still under colonial rule. So a big agenda for the OAU back then was this whole issue of liberating African countries. Um, but after a significant number of African countries had become independent, then the OAU started paying more attention to global issues and became the platform from where African governments and African countries sort of consolidated the African position to better position the continent in this global uh, and I think the AU now, uh, about 10 years, I think has taken us a step forward and looks not just, uh, it looks at a whole range of things now. Uh, it looks at Africa and the need for uh, the, con the regional e uh, economic blocks, for example, within the African Union. The big political issues at the global level, but also the internal issues. So we created, for example, NEPAD, the, 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 the partnership for uh, uh, for, 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 for development, uh, the new partnership for Africa, Africa's development, a sort of a local homegrown uh, instrument for, for monitoring change and development and progress. Um, and over the years what we've seen is that the AU is paying a lot of attention to the other socio-economic issues, so they are taking positions about issues of food security, they're looking at issues of health care, for example, big commitments have been made at the AU level on how to fight communicable diseases, malaria, HIV, AIDS, and so forth. How do we commit resources to education, for example, um, and also this whole idea of making sure that the continent takes full advantage of the resources that exist in the continent, uh, increase the value addition on the continent so that we don't get shortchanged in the global economy because all these tremendous commodities that come out of the continent, it is incredible that we still languish in the kind of poverty we have uh, when we have such wealth on the continent. So part of the agenda of the AU now is actually this idea that we can trade with each other, we need to consolidate that so that we can contribute more effectively to more than two, at the moment, what, 2% global trade 
is on the continent, very, very little. The AU is now projecting that within the next five years, we need to get that up to about 5%. So increasing trade within uh, will better position uh, African countries to trade uh, in a global economy, which has become rather big and uh, sometimes quite unmanageable. And so none of the African countries, no matter how strong they are, South Africa or Nigeria, uh, is able to really function and function effectively and serve its people effectively if it is going it alone in this global economy. So SADC, the Southern Africa Development Community, the East African Community, ECOWAS in the south, we have a central one, and the one in the north in Maghreb. I think all these regional blocks coming together uh, under the AU um, and, and looking at issues of peace and security, the border issues that uh, have plagued us for many years, uh, civil wars uh, within countries, cross-country uh, conflict, uh, managing all those. You've seen how the African Union, for example, has responded to the crisis in Somalia. Uh, the role that they've played in different countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, you name it, in the last four or five years. I think uh, that's an important platform for the African countries and uh, with better uh, uh, as, as the leadership. We are slowly shedding off the old, I don't know what to call them, you know, the bad leaders who have really let us down. Uh, and as we see new leadership emerging in different countries on the continent, I, see, I think you will see that reflected in the leadership of the AU as well. Uh, if we get good individual leaders in each of those countries, you'll eventually see an AU that really represents the aspirations uh, of, of the people of the continent. I'm going to ask Ambassador Green to give some final remarks, um, after which, I don't know, there's some roles over there, um, seems to be anyway. And thank you all uh, for coming, uh, for your attention and your interest, which is apparent in what goes on on the continent. Ambassador. Thanks, Connie. And, and I actually want to close by uh, sort of focusing back in on something that, that Connie just said. Uh, she talked about how um, poverty um, has been a hindrance to democratization. And she's right. And I think that's something that we shouldn't lose sight of. Again, comes back to the central question, why do we talk about uh, development in democratic terms? Because poverty, whether it be um, you know, simply looking at income, but also the hunger that goes with poverty, the lack of access to health care that goes with poverty, the lack of access to education that goes with poverty. Poverty is a source of enslavement. When you have profound poverty, and you have profound poverty in too many areas in this world, you make the impoverished absolutely dependent upon either outside money or a local leader, it leads to corruption, it leads to lack of responsiveness, it leads to a shattering of dreams and expectations. So uh, those of us who are involved in development, you know, we believe fundamentally that unless you tackle poverty, unless you give people an avenue for hope and an opportunity to make some advancement, it's hard to have effective democracy. It's hard to make progress in fighting so many of the um, uh, issues that we look at. So, um, for example, when we tackle poverty, and I'm, I'm a believer in having that strong indicator for the MCC, pass, fail, you have to succeed, but we also have to recognize that in the long run it's very, very difficult to tackle those issues unless you focus on the basic needs that people, not just in Africa, have, but people <laughs> all around the world have. Those are universal needs. Those are universal sentiments. If we can help be a friend to Africa in tackling those challenges, so many of the other challenges become uh, very solvable, very attainable.